While Nicholas had been busy playing with his new best friend, tensions in Europe had been rising. It just so happened that in 1914, one Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary went for a drive with the top down in Sarajevo. One thing leads to another, and suddenly Russia found itself at war with half of Europe. A wave of patriotism swept through Russia. The capital was renamed to Petrograd because St. Petersburg sounded a bit too German. Even revolutionaries were getting on board. To them, World War I was a big stinky imperialist war, but they didn't want their big stinky imperialist replaced by a foreign one. So pretty much everyone wanted Russia to win. I hope Russia loses. Geez, read the room, Lenin. Lenin hoped Russia would lose because that would help him overthrow the Tsar. As long as he did that, who cares if Germany blows up half the country? And blow up half the country, they did. An inefficient Tsarist government meant there were shortages of just about everything you need to fight a war. And if losing a teensy-weensy war with Japan upset the people, losing a giant Wyatt war like this was much worse. Soldiers were deserting, the economy was imploding, and in no time, Russia was starving. The peasants were getting more peasanty, the workers were getting more workery, all the while Germany was getting more Germanery. Dimitri, we need to win this war. I need someone with a great military mind to step in and take control. You're right. How about General Hickelooper? How about me? You can't run the war. Who'll be in charge of the country while you're gone? Obviously, my German wife and a homeless wizard. Duh. Nicholas declared himself commander-in-chief and went to the front lines, leaving his German wife in charge while they were fighting, the Germans. It wasn't a good look. And because Alexander was so close to Rasputin, people believed that he was actually calling the shots and secretly destroying Russia, and maybe even boinking her. An even worser look. At this point, a bunch of nobles just couldn't take it anymore. Rasputin is destroying the country. We have to break his magic spell over the Tsar. But how? He's magic. Hmm. 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 Dude. Very cool. Hey, it's Rasputin. The sexy party is running a little late, but in the meantime, why don't you try one of these totally not poisoned cakes? Dude, why'd you say it like that? He's totally gonna know they're poisoned now. Shut up. I said they're not poisoned. Dude, he just ate so much poison. How is he still alive? It must be the magic. Go with plan B. Is he dead? <laughs> See, Boris? I told you he was the Antichrist and you didn't believe me. Can you shut up for one minute and help me roll him up? Are you sure he's dead? I don't know, but I'm supposed to be hosting a charity auction right now. Can we get this over with? Okay, now he's dead. The murder of Rasputin, just like his life, is shrouded in mystery and speculation. He probably didn't really die like that, but he also probably didn't really heal people. He probably didn't influence the Tsar as much as people thought. He probably wasn't secretly destroying the country. But what he definitely did do, even in his death, was ruin the Tsar's reputation. Russia's autocracy looked more outdated than ever, and the Russian people were taking notice. Come on, men. Remember what we're fighting for. Yeah, no. We're out. World War I left Russia broke, hungry, and exhausted. And with Nicholas acting as commander-in-chief, he was getting even more blame. For the second time, Russia was on the brink of revolution. By 1917, Russia had been fighting a war it couldn't afford for three years. They were running out of many things, most worryingly, food. On International Women's Day 1917, thousands of hungry women in Petrograd were so sick of being hungry that they took to the streets. And it turns out it's not just women who experience hunger, but men too. So the next day they joined in as well. Gatherings on the streets were forbidden, but I'm not sure how you'd arrest 250,000 people. The crowds demanded an end to the war, an end to food rationing, and even an end to the Tsar's autocracy. Now normally the troops would deal with this kind of thing, but as it turns out, soldiers get hungry too. And they were also tired of having to kill their fellow Russians so much. So entire regiments mutinied in the capital and they joined the crowd as well, trashing symbols of the Tsar and his autocratic regime. Things were escalating very quickly. Liberal politicians watching the riots in the streets had long been dissatisfied with the Tsar, since he would shut their parliament down anytime they did something he didn't like. They believed the only way to bring stability back to the streets was for Nicholas II to abdicate. The riots continued. The police fired on soldiers. Soldiers fired on soldiers. The workers re-established the Petrograd Soviet. Politicians began arresting the Tsar's ministers. He may have been an autocrat, but he just lost complete control of his capital city. Talk about embarrassing. Nicholas, the troops have turned against us. The people have taken over the city. They've even cut my phone line. Hello? Hello? Hmm, the phones are down. Things must be bad. I'd better go back there. Nicholas hopped on the next train back to Petrograd, but he never made it to the city. His train was met by military generals and other politicians. What's going on? Nicholas, look man, we need to talk. It's not you, it's us.
Aw, oh, who am I kidding? No, it's definitely you. During the whole crisis in Petrograd, the liberals convinced the generals that if Nicholas abdicated, the people would calm down, and the generals were on board. They didn't have time to quell the chaos, because don't forget, they were still losing a global, all-encompassing war against the Germans. And with the military no longer on his side, Nicholas had no choice but to step down. Throughout his entire reign, he had done everything he could to keep all the power for himself. And in the end, that's exactly what left him with none. But then there was a big question. Who would replace Nicholas? Well, his son Alexei was next in line. Hey buddy, daddy couldn't handle the complex socioeconomic problems of a giant multinational, multi-ethnic empire that's engaged in total war with all of Europe. You think you could give it a shot? Alexei just wasn't ready to be czar. Nicholas did have a brother, but given the state of the empire, he wasn't keen either. And so, 300 years of Romanov rule in Russia just kind of came to an end. The earlier 1905 revolution hadn't changed much, but this new revolution had left Russia without a czar. And still, before the year was over, there would be one more revolution left to come. Nicholas's failure as commander of the armed forces was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Hungry woman, absolute chaos, and the end of the czar. Oh, hey guys, says here there's been a revolution, and the reign of the czars has ended. Oh, come on, I missed another one? Why am I even in this video? Well, it's not like you could have done anything. As long as there's a world war, you can't get back to Russia. Who wants to start a revolution? I mean, a revolution. Dang it! Despite getting rid of Nick, Russia was still at war with half of Europe. The Germans, however, had an idea. They thought that if they helped Lenin get back, he would cause trouble for the new Russian government. So they put him on a train. Destination, Petrograd. It was a long journey, and while Lenin was cooped up in his train, things in Russia were changing. Workers were taking control of their factories. Soldiers were socking it to their mean old officers. Without a czar, a big old power vacuum had opened up, and someone needed to fill it. The liberals proposed they be in charge, and they set up the provisional government. The workers, however, had already begun establishing local Soviets, largely controlled by the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. And since neither felt like they had the power to oust the other, Russia ended up in a classic dual power conundrum. The two coexisted, with the provisional government becoming the official government and the elected Soviets issuing orders to the workers and soldiers. This power balance was delicate, and all it would take is one bold revolutionary to come along and give everyone a big-brained beatdown. Oh boy, Lenin's coming home. I can't wait for him to see all the great things we've accomplished. And I'm gonna show him my fan art. Oh look, here he comes now. Shut up, shut up! You all suck! The provisional government sucks, the Soviet sucks, even your fan art sucks! <laughs> Why does he have to be so mean? In case you couldn't tell, Lenin wasn't a fan of everything that had been happening. In his April theses, he called the provisional government and the Soviets a bunch of big bourgeois bozos. And he kinda had a point. There was still a lot for the Russian people to be mad about. The provisional government hadn't got Russia out of the war, the people were still hungry, and the peasants were still hoping to get more land. Meanwhile, the Soviets hadn't done much to change things either. But even though they weren't perfect, a lot of people did like what the new government had been doing. There was progress. The secret police were disbanded, the death penalty abolished. They even planned to hold elections, meaning for the first time ever, the Russian people could choose their own government. To many, Lenin seemed like some out-of-touch weirdo. If Lenin wanted to go from whiny irrelevant zero to hunky con communist hero, he'd need to shake things up a bit. So he and the Bolsheviks came up with a hot new slogan that promised to give the people what the provisional government wouldn't. Peace. Don't like war? We'll end it. Land. You want land? We'll give it to you. Bread. Hungry? Scooby dooby doo. Lenin also called for all power to the Soviets, which meant getting rid of the provisional government and having the Soviets run the place. A communist dream. The people liked these slogans, and bit by bit, the Bolsheviks became more popular. Some Mensheviks even began switching sides. But even though the people thought Lenin's slogans rocked, as long as the provisional government didn't mess up, they'd continue to support it. So let's check in on the provisional government. Oh, provisional government, you've made a big mess. The provisional government lasted for just nine months, but those nine months were chaos. The people wanted Russia out of World War I, but Minister of War Alexander Kerensky thought instead of doing that, why not do the exact opposite? If the people saw more Russian victories, they'd have to support the new government. And that went just about as well as you might expect. These heavy defeats worsened the Russian economy and made the hungry people hungrier. And by now, I think you know what comes next. They trashed the place. More looting, more rioting, more violence. It was like the Tsar had never abdicated. Tens of thousands of armed workers took to the streets during some of the worst violence Petrograd had seen yet. And in response, Kerensky called in the troops who opened fire on the demonstrators. 
For now, Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders wanted to distance themselves from the violence, but the crowds marched under Bolshevik slogans, and as a result, Kerensky, now the Prime Minister, took the opportunity to stamp down on the Bolsheviks. Their leaders were arrested, Lenin was accused of being a German agent, and he was forced to flee to Finland in disguise. This sucks! Now I'll never get to have my revolution! Why are you wearing a dress? It's a disguise, idiot! And it makes me feel pretty. Kerensky had successfully dealt with the violence, but he just couldn't catch a break. This increasing support for more extreme forms of socialism, along with the poor handling of the war, alarmed traditional liberals and bougie business boys. To appease them, Kerensky decided to promote a military legend to Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. Someone who hated the revolution, loved the death penalty, and was devoutly anti-socialist. General Kornilov. Hey man, thanks for the promotion. That was real swell of you. Of course, with you by my side, who would dare try to overthrow me? How about me? I did not see this coming. Unfortunately for Kerensky, Kornilov hated the liberal and socialist reforms of the new government, particularly the dumb socialist soldiers committees. The army was no place for undisciplined left-wing snowflakes. Fearing a Bolshevik takeover was imminent, Kornilov ordered his men towards Petrograd to oust the Soviet and take over. Kerensky freaked out and he needed help. Since he knew Trotsky was finger licking good at organizing, he and other Bolshevik leaders were released, and they, along with the Soviet, organized the defense of Petrograd. Kornilov had the power of soldiers, but the Soviet had the power of workers. And they did what workers do best. Railroad workers diverted Kornilov's men away. Telegraph workers messed with his communications. They even infiltrated his forces and encouraged the demoralized men to desert. They were also armed en masse, but in the end, no fighting was necessary because Kornilov's coup just fell apart and Kornilov was sent straight to prison. Everything was coming up Kerensky. Hey, thanks for the help, boys. Couldn't have done it without you. Now that there's no longer any threat, how about you, uh, return all those guns I gave you? Hmm. No. Oh, no. In order to kill a rat, Kerensky had just given a gun to a bear. A Bolshevik bear. The whole affair was a huge propaganda win for them. They had defended the revolution, and their popularity skyrocketed. They found themselves elected to the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets, with Trotsky even becoming chairman in Petrograd. They were now in a very powerful position. Almost powerful enough for Lenin to return home from Finland and finally stage his long-awaited communist revolution. The Bolsheviks began planning their takeover of the Russian government. Some got cold feet and began arguing against Lenin's armed revolution in favor of a more peaceful approach. And they even wrote newspaper articles about it, which kind of gave the whole scheme away. The Bolsheviks are planning an armed revolution? I did not see this coming. Kerensky began arresting Bolsheviks, and as a result, Lenin and the boys felt they had no choice but to commence the revolution right now. Lenin was back in Petrograd, but was still in hiding, so Trotsky got the ball rolling, using his position as Soviet chairman to organize the Bolshevik militias. Now, if you were to ask Soviet artists, the revolution went something like this. As much as they would like you to think it was a glorious, violent, heroic takeover, the truth seems to be a little more underwhelming. The Bolsheviks just kind of walked into key buildings in the city and took control. Bolshevik supporting sailors even brought in a huge battleship, but there wasn't really any fighting. Nobody really tried to stop them. In just one day, they took control of the city. Next, Kerensky just managed to escape before the Bolsheviks surrounded the Winter Palace, placing the provisional government under siege inside. Is it safe to come out yet? I think so. Fear my revolutionary might! Give me that. That night, Lenin came out of hiding to play a bigger role in the revolution. With him back at the helm, they had one more job to do. Storm the Winter Palace and arrest the provisional government. And here comes the final showdown. The palace was defended by a force known as the Battalion of Death, who immediately gave up. And just like that, Lenin had won. As far as violent, bloody revolutionary uprisings go, this wasn't really one of them. But Lenin was finally in charge of Russia. He had spent his whole life dreaming of this moment. He set up the first council of people's commissars, his own cabinet, with him in charge. This was it, his chance to finally make his communist utopia with equality and freedoms beyond compare. Hey Lenin, before we took power, they were planning on holding elections. Shall we go ahead with those? Of course, you can't have a communist utopia without high levels of political participation. The proletariat should be free to- We lost. To it. What? The social revolutionaries won. We lost. Those don't count. Lenin claimed the elections were unfair and the constituent assembly they created was counter-revolutionary. He presented the new assembly with a motion that basically said, sign here and give up your power. And when the assembly was like, no, Lenin said, see, they're disobeying me. Proof they're counter-revolutionary. Shut it down, boys. Moderate socialists and others weren't happy when Lenin had the assembly closed by force. And when campaigners began taking to the streets, they were fired upon. 
For Lenin, setting up a communist utopia was looking suspiciously like setting up a dictatorship. While he was implementing many of the communist policies you'd expect, he was also refusing to work with other political parties and cracking down on opposition. Hey Lenin, are you setting up a dictatorship? I'll shoot you if you are. Of course not. What a crazy theory. Anyway. I'm pleased to announce I'm setting up a secret police force to repress and kill traitors. And by traitors, I of course mean anyone not loyal to me. Owie, 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 owie. The assassination attempt made on Lenin's life in August 1918 failed. But in response, the Bolsheviks ramped up their oppression. But while all of this chaos was erupting back home, Lenin and the boys were also distracted by another problem. They were still at war with the Germans, and they had promised to give the people peace. 